And I'm Sorry. pleased to introduce Dr. Martha Nance. She's the medical director at the Sorry. Struthers Parkinson Center, and she's taking time out of her date and seeing patients right up yes. until the last moment. And, yes, and I didn't well, get to put my actual shoes on. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much Sorry. for joining us. Here yeah. is your clicker. Well, it's my, I apologize. It's my bad. It's when they, uh, they, you know, it's on 96th Street or Avenue or whatever. So, and all I saw was the <coughs> Orthodox. <laughs> so I, then I drove another two miles. I said, oh, that's too far. Anyway, hi. Sorry I'm late. Um, yes, and as she said, I'm Martha Nance. I'm a neurologist and the director at the Struthers Parkinson Center, where some of you may have gone. How many people have ever been to Struthers? How many people have never heard of Struthers? Ah, good, okay. Um, so it's actually kind of fun to listen to somebody else showing the slides. Um, but yeah, it is kind of a discouraging thing that we are taught that by the time you actually walk in the, in the door the very first time with just a little hint of tremor. Um, people use different numbers. You said 85%, the slide says 70%. Some people say 50%. It kind of depends at what moment you actually show up in the doctor's office. But the point is a lot of the cells in that part of the brain, that substantia nigra, are, are already gone by that time. What's remarkable is how well you can do for so many years on those last 50% of the cells. Um, but it tells you why the disease is challenging. Um, and just to um, back up a little bit, um, this is a really common disease, and it's gonna be you know, increasingly common as the population ages. Uh, there's increasing, obviously, interest in doing research in Parkinson's disease as the baby boomers age. Um, and uh, and I think we're kind of on the brink of having really novel treatments for the disease itself, uh, but they're not there yet. Currently today, the only treatments we have are treatments directed at the symptoms. So what medications you take, what treatments you use, depends a little bit on what symptoms you have. Um, the other comment, I, I, uh, I'm not sure if you got to this yet, but there's this thing called the Lewy body. Uh, Everybody heard the word Louis body? Anybody not heard the word Louis body? Be brave, raise your hand. Yeah. So um, in medical school, uh, you are, if you're looking at slides of, of slices of brain tissue under the microscope, um, the change that you expect to see in the brain, uh, in the brain cells that are affected by Parkinson's is the presence of this little purple blob. So the cell uh, down in the lower right in this picture um, has a um, little purple blob in it, and that is called the Louis body because it was described by a pathologist named Dr. Louis. Um, and that includes a bunch of, I would just call it a pile of trash, basically. The, um, it seems that your brain cells have difficulty dumping out the trash. So you could imagine if you um, were living in a house someplace and 60 or 70 or 80 years went by and you didn't dump out the trash. Oh. oh. <laughs> Might not work so well. And the same thing kind of happens in your brain cells, that after 60, 70, 80 years, sometimes these worn out, tired old proteins um, accumulate in kind of a trash heap in the cell. One of the things that they're um, trying to sort out in research is would it be nice to um, you know, have some way to just clean out that Louis body, just erase that little purple spot, put a magnet in there that it sticks to? Or is the Louis body the cell's best attempt to kind of sweep all the dust into the corner so that at least the rest of the cell is working okay and you don't have all these sick, tired, worn out proteins just sort of floating around in the cell? We don't quite know the answer to that yet. In people with Parkinson's disease, um, early in the disease, you will see these Lewy bodies in a fairly restricted group of cells in the brain. Say, for instance, the cells in the substantia nigra, or the cells that those cells connect to. There's another condition called Lewy body disease, or Lewy body dementia, which some of you may have heard of. There's a lot of sort of um, vagueness about when does Parkinson sort of merge into Lewy body or, or is Parkinson's really part of Lewy body disease? But the textbook definition of Lewy body disease includes symptoms that look like 
Parkinson's, movement symptoms, but at the very onset, right at the beginning, not only does the person have movement symptoms, but they're also developing dementia. Not just, I forgot my, that guy's name that I met yesterday. Um, not just, you know, I went into my room and forgot I was going to get my glasses. Um, but really dementia, uh, difficulty, you know, calculating, remembering things, following a recipe, navigating, uh, and also hallucinations right at the onset of the disease. So if you have Parkinson-like movement symptoms and dementia and hallucinations right at the onset, day one, first two years, then you might use the term Lewy body disease, or some people use the term Lewy body dementia. Um, and if you look at the brain of somebody with Lewy body dementia, if you look at slides under the microscope, you see Lewy bodies in a much broader territory in the brain. So it kind of fits that Lewy body is sort of a bigger disease that's very similar to Parkinson's, similar symptoms, but, but more of them. Um, and as we'll find out, as we'll talk about, um, uh, as time goes on, there's sort of this, this theory, um, no, okay, there's a theory now that's evolving that Parkinson's um, may actually sort of, you know, either come in through your stomach or it comes in through your nose. It's something you ate. It's a virus you inhaled. And it kind of starts in the lower part of the, it comes in to sort of the lower part of the brain. And in a sense, the pathology, the changes in the brain actually spread up from the lower part of the brain into the midbrain where the substantia nigra is, and then the patient goes to the doctor. And then 15 years later, the disease kind of spreads to involve a bigger part of the brain, the sort of light, lighter pink shaded, the cortex, the thinking part of the brain. So if, if you have Parkinson's for long enough, if you live for 15, 20, 25 years after diagnosis of Parkinson's, you will often live to find out that it's not just movement symptoms anymore. It does start to affect your thinking and your memory and your mental processing. Um, so we don't usually change the name of the disease 15 years later from Parkinson's to Lewy body disease. But I sometimes use the phrase, you know, sort of tantamount to Lewy body disease. So here you are 15, 20 years into Parkinson's. You certainly have movement symptoms. And now in the last year or two, you've started to develop, you know, really significant changes in cognition, and pretty soon you're, you're maybe um, seeing things that other people don't think are there. So there's this idea that the, that the disease actually, uh, the disease process actually spreads from one cell to another um, and it eventually involves a bigger part of the brain, which is why the symptoms become uh, bigger, <laughs> not just movement symptoms. Um, so this is, this is more, um, again, this is all sort of introductory before we start really focusing in on thinking and memory issues. But we mentioned the dementia with Lewy bodies being something sort of off on the side. There are a number of conditions that sort of overlap with Parkinson's, some of which have specific names. And sometimes we see patients who don't quite fit any of the names. They, they just have their own set of symptoms, not quite this, not quite that. But you may have heard some of these other terms you don't have to have an exam at the end of the hour, but the, the medical students do. You know, um, what's the difference between progressive supranuclear palsy and Parkinson's or multiple system atrophy or corticobasal syndrome? These are all conditions that often sort of start out overlapping enough with Parkinson's that you may have heard for the first year or two, the doctor said, well, I think you have Parkinson's. And then somewhere along the line, somebody says, well, maybe it's not really Parkinson's. I think it's more, it looks a little more like PSP or more like MSA. Um, so there are a number of conditions that can sort of overlap with Parkinson's. How do we diagnose Parkinson's disease? Well, you have to have, you guys know this better than I do, you have to have a little slowness of movement. Um, sometimes you have a little tremor, you certainly have a little stiffness, and then you have a change in the, the posture and the gait, the shuffling steps or the sort of stooped posture. Um, not everybody has tremor. Um, something, again, people quote different numbers, 20, 25%, 30% of people with Parkinson's um, don't have tremor. So how many people in the room have Parkinson's and do have tremor? How many people in the room have Parkinson's and don't have tremor? Yeah, so you can see it's a smaller number of people, but not, not a, 
not a very small number of people. And then if you ask patients what actually happened, um, rather than telling patients, which neurologists always love to do, uh, we always like to tell you what your symptoms should be. Um, but if you actually ask patients what their symptoms were, people will often say, oh my God, I lost my sense of smell 20 years ago. How many people in the room lost their sense of smell eons ago? Yeah. How many people, you don't, I'm not going to make you raise your hand for constipation, but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but how many spouses are getting uh, serenaded at night? How many people in the room who are a spouse get hit or kicked or the guy's talking to you or she's singing in her sleep? Yeah. So quite often this acting out of the dreams, what we call REM behavior disorder, where you're not as quite as paralyzed as you should be when you're asleep, so you actually are moving and talking during your dreams. That may precede the onset of motor symptoms also by a number of years. And some of our patients say, well, I've been constipated ever since I was a kid. I mean, I, I was the one that mother used to have, well, anyway, um, yeah. So before we had levodopa, um, which was it's 50 years ago now that levodopa came to be, actually 50 one or two, um, before levodopa, um, the, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's really predominated. If you, if you couldn't, if you didn't, if levodopa didn't exist or any of our other medications didn't exist, you would become increasingly immobile over three years, five years, eight years, certainly 10 years into Parkinson's, you would be quite immobile. And then you would develop the complications of immobility. You could get lung infections or bed sores or bladder infections. So really the, the motor symptoms predominated and people often didn't live for 20 or 30 years after a diagnosis of Parkinson's. But since we've been able to treat those motor symptoms of Parkinson's, people basically live for a really long time. I have a number of patients with Parkinson's diagnosed over 30 years ago. And I have one fellow I follow who claims He's had Parkinson's since um, actually the year I was born, which is getting close to 60 years. Actually, it is 60 years this year. <coughs> um, you know, that's a long time to live with this disease. So, so it's, we've really, with our medications to treat symptoms, we've really transformed Parkinson's from a fatal disease to a chronic disease. But just like we transformed diabetes from a fatal disease before they had insulin to a chronic disease, the people with diabetes live on to know that 25 years after your diagnosis of diabetes, you may have nerve troubles or retinal troubles or kidney troubles that are due to the diabetes, but taking insulin doesn't fix those problems. Similarly, people with Parkinson's will live on to get a whole range of other symptoms that levodopa isn't going to fix. So you don't take levodopa to help your, your um, depression or to help the cognitive change or the sleep disturbance. We have to use other treatments to address this myriad of symptoms that, that people may develop as time goes on. Not everybody by any means gets all of these symptoms. This is, this is just a menu from which your disease will select. Um, and, you know, some people have terrible trouble with one or another of these symptoms, but not, none of another. Just like some people have, you know, the thing for Parkinson's is tremor, and other people say, you know, I never had tremor. So, so the disease is unique to each individual, and I don't expect everybody in the room to develop this whole list of symptoms. That makes sense? We have a staging system for Parkinson's. It's really old. That um, Again, it, it really harkens back to the era when Parkinson's strictly had to do with movement. Um, so stage one is symptoms just on one side of the body. And stage two is symptoms on both sides of the body, but no balance troubles. Stage three is somebody who's having some balance trouble. Stage four is really needing help. You kind of can't do it all by yourself anymore. And stage five would be wheelchair bound or bed bound. Um, this staging system really does not take into account those non-motor symptoms, the, the cognitive symptoms. <coughs> it also doesn't um, work very well for the other things that may go on in your life. By the time you're 70 years old and old enough to have Parkinson's, you may have lung disease or heart disease or some hip troubles or back troubles. <coughs> 
that may contribute to how limited you are. <clears throat> but we still use a scale because nobody's come up with a better one. <coughs> so on to cognitive changes. There's sort of a whole range of cognitive change in Parkinson's. From day one, depending on how carefully you look, um, people with Parkinson's are always going to say, are always going to test out a little bit worse than people who don't have Parkinson's. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Too much rushing about. <clears throat> oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> I, I won't either. So, um, <clears throat> if you do formal testing, everybody with Parkinson's is going to test out a little worse than they would if they didn't have Parkinson's. And that's partly just because you do things slower. So you're just not going to physically write as many things as quickly or put as many pegs in a hole um, if, if you have Parkinson's than, than if you don't have Parkinson's. And some people will also notice with their Parkinson's that just as they're a little bit slow in moving, they're just a little bit slower in thinking. Does anybody sort of feel that way that when your meds aren't working, you feel like not only do you slow down physically, but you sort of slow down mentally too. <clears throat> but I would not use the word um, dementia to describe that slight slowness of thought. Then there's a sort of middle ground of what we call mild cognitive impairment, um, where, you know, it's starting to be more than just I forgot where I put my glasses or I can't remember that, that guy's name from, from last week. But it but it's not really interfering with your day-to-day -day function. And then there's dementia, which really requires um, changes in multiple domains um, that really is impacting on your ability to do your day-to-day -day, um, tasks. So what are the, the different domains of sort of cognition? When, we, when you, um, if you went to a neuropsychologist uh, or a psychologist, they would say, well, there's different kinds of cognitive activity. There's language and there's um, uh, attention and, and just remembering th things that somebody just said. There's visual spatial. Do you ever do those tasks where you had to mentally sp spin an object? You know, they, they say, well, here's your object and which of the A, B, C, D, or E is what it would look like if you turned it to the side. And you're like trying to figure out how to manipulate this thing visually. Um, so visual spatial function. There's plain old memory. There's, you know, remembering um, you know, the story you read 20 minutes ago or 20 years ago. And then there's executive function, which is sort of an interesting concept. Executive function are um, the things that executives do, but we all also do uh, in our daily lives. You have to plan what you're doing today. In order to come here today, you had to plan better than I did what time to get here. Uh, which meant you had to get up and you had to, you know, get dressed and you had to eat breakfast and you had to make sure you had gas in the car. And, you know, all, there's a whole bunch of things you had to do just in order to get here. It required planning. It required sequencing. It required um, making a decision. Do I come to this meeting or do I go to my grandchild's um, school play? Um, so th these are all executive functions, making decisions, multitasking, um, uh, planning, sequencing, completing a task, uh, getting distracted and then getting back on track again. All of these are executive functions. And people can have trouble in one area um, and not another, or one area more than another. Um, and uh, quite often we see changes, for instance, in um, attention and concentration. This is sometimes hard to judge um, for two reasons. One is, um, if you're hard of hearing, um, then, you know, you may not quite hear what's actually being said. Well, no wonder you've, it's like you're not paying attention because you're actually not hearing. How many people here argue with their spouse about whether you need to get a hearing aid? <laughs> Just go get one, okay? Both of you, husband and wife, okay? I don't care whether you got Parkinson's or not, you need to optimize the information going in. I don't know what it is about hearing aids. People are happy to get their cataract surgery. 95-year-olds get cataract surgery, but nobody wants to put their hearing aid in. I don't know. Can somebody explain that to me? Huh? It's humbling. I guess it's because the hearing aid is a vis a visible, but when you get your cataracts done, nobody knows you actually had that. I don't know. 
So that's one thing that, that can sort of manifest as uh, decreased attention is if you're actually not hearing. So please, everybody, go get your hearing aid checked or use it or whatever so you optimize what's getting in. And the other thing, of course, is just relationships. So um, I would argue my husband doesn't pay a darn bit of attention ever, um, and he would argue that I do the same. Um, so, you know, when you've been together with somebody for a long time, you, 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 you know, <clears throat> tune each other out. Um, and... And quite often people come into my clinic and the spouse will say, oh my God, he hasn't been this bright and interactive since, well, the last time we were here. Well, why is that? Because, you know, he got excited about, you know, just getting out of the house, doing something a little bit different. You know, you're, you're seeing the, the doctor and so you kind of sit up a little straighter and, you, and it forces you to kind of think about how am I doing? And so you have to, you know, you're going to be answering questions. So... But, but people can really have trouble doing some of these things, attending, concentrating, sort of juggling multiple things in your memory. As I said, executive function includes things like multitasking, organization, planning, getting distracted, and then sort of getting back on, on uh, task. And another related phenomenon that's a huge complaint for many of our folks is, um, is this inability to initiate activity. The kind of ugly word we use for that is the word apathy. When in lay conversation, if you were use the word apathy, it's sort of an insult. You know, he's so apathetic. Um, but in neurology, it's really a neurological term that has to do with the part of the brain that gives you your get up and go. And that part of the brain has got up and gone. And so it really, truly, the, the people with Parkinson's get to a point where they lack um, useful function. It's not going to be all or none, but you have reduced function in the part of the brain that actually gives you the ability to get up and go, to plan, to initiate, to execute a complex activity. Does that make sense? So, and it's a huge problem. We're getting all kinds of noises over here. Um, uh, you know, it creates problems with the spouse when, you know, again, depending on the relationship, if, if you know, she used to be the, the organization queen, she would plan this and do that and plan the meals and get the wash done and now she just doesn't really get those things done. That's, that's a struggle if, if that was sort of um, your role in the family before. Or a, a um, care partner who says, he won't do anything and I have to, uh, it's like pulling teeth to get him to, you know, he used to love to go out to the movies and we used to walk and he won't do it. And it, it can be very difficult for somebody with Parkinson's to sort of initiate that kind of activity. Memory, again, and I think this relates more to the attention, that the short-term memory seems to change, but, but our patients absolutely remember, you know, where they served in the Army and, and, you know, things that happened 50 years ago are clear as a bell. It's, you know, what you had for breakfast yesterday that's more of a challenge. Um, language is not usually quite so much of an issue in Parkinson's, although this, um, uh, you know, finding the name, finding the word is, is fairly common. But actual grammatical errors or phonetic errors um, is less common uh, in Parkinson's, a little more common in Alzheimer's. Um, but trouble uh, retrieving that right word can be a challenge. And then visual spatial is a big deal with our patients. It's a very common problem in, uh, it, you know, impaired sense of direction, trouble navigating, getting lost in familiar places. And how many of you have a spouse who goes to sit in the chair and they get to about here and they start turning to sit and, you know, and they're three feet away from the chair? Um, this sort of uh, misperceiving the distance can be a big issue, which um, activity that we all start doing when we're 15 years old um, and refuse to ever give up might be tremendously impacted by visual spatial dysfunction. Yeah, it's very good. Even that convoluted question, you got the answer. Yeah, driving is a major visual spatial activity, you have to navigate, you have to deal with the fact that the, the, there's a detour um, and figure out where to turn while at the same time keeping track of your foot and your hands and then the kid runs out chasing the ball and you gotta do something. Um, so very much a visual spatial activity, very much a multitasking activity 
and these are things that, that are really going to be challenges for people with, with Parkinson's. And, and I always say driving is the one thing that you do where if you screw up, somebody else can get hurt. And, and you really don't want that to happen. Um, so um, dementia, as I said, is, is sort of a term you use when this gets to a significant point where it's, it's really impacting on, on your daily life, social relationships, the things you used to do you're just not doing anymore. And, and the idea that it's a permanent thing. So you could be temporarily unable to do those things if you were intoxicated. Um, or, you know, had a brain infection or something. We wouldn't use the word dementia to describe somebody who's not making sense when they're roaring drunk. You would just say they're roaring drunk. And you expect them to be functioning normally again once the, the toxic drug wears off. But dementia implies that there is a, a, a loss of nerve cells that's underlying this loss of function. Number one cause of dementia is Alzheimer's. So there's um, presumably three million people in the country with Alzheimer's and one million people with Parkinson's. Um, and something like um, 30 plus percent of people over the age of 85, and the statistic I always read was that 50 percent of 90 year olds, if you look at the brain under the microscope, the brain has Alzheimer's, whether or not the person's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. If you look microscopically at the brain, by age 90, 50 percent of people have the pathologic changes of Alzheimer's. And, you know, again, if you live long enough <laughs> um, with your Parkinson's, you know, if the typical onset age of Parkinson's is 60 to 65, and you live 20 more years, you're going to be 80 to 85. And you're going to probably have some cognitive change by that point, if not overt dementia, whether it's strictly speaking 100% due to Parkinson's, or whether you might have a little touch of Alzheimer's creeping in there too, does it really matter? Um, it would matter if we had really different treatments or if we had a cure for one but not the other. At the moment, it, it may not really matter in the treatment sense or even the prognosis whether it's 100% a Parkinson thing or whether there's a little bit of something else creeping in. So, and this just sort of beats on the, the sort of definition and the things that you see in people with dementia. Uh, oftentimes, with dementia come... Um, um, sort of changes in level of arousal. So, so I will often hear um, either the patient or the family say, you know, he sleeps 12 hours at night, then he gets up and he eats breakfast and he takes a nap, and then after lunch he's taking a nap. He's sleeping like 18 hours a day. Or she used to be going and going and going, and now she's taking this sort of three-hour nap in the afternoon. So, so sort of increased um, sleepiness is, is um, pretty common in people with, with certainly with a Parkinson dementia. Um, age, uh, you know, obviously the more rapidly your Parkinson seems to be progressing, everybody kind of maps out their own course. And a lot of people it's very slowly progressive over years to decades, but some people it seems to kind of get worse or quicker. And those people may have dementia at an earlier um, number of years into the disease. <sighs> Hallucinations. How many people have seen the ad? <laughs> How many people have not seen the commercial on TV? Yeah. How many people turn the TV off when the commercial comes on? <laughs> Whoever's back there from the... <clears throat> yeah. Hi. <laughs> I've told them that I don't like the ad. It, it actually... I, I don't like the ad. It's very uncomfortable. Um, what am I talking about? There's an, an, a commercial on TV that talks about hallucinations and Parkinson's, and it's a commercial for um, a product, um, Pimavanserin or Nuplazid, that has been FDA approved to treat hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. It's the only drug that's actually got that specific approval. So it's a wonderful thing to have available. You can't fault a company for advertising its product, but I think a lot of people find it very unsettling because of the implication. Um, but we put it up on these slides too, you know, 60%. And again, you see different numbers. Is it 30% or is it 80%? It almost doesn't matter. It's 100% if it's you. And the idea is that it's not, you know, it's not rare. <laughs> it, it certainly can happen somewhere along the line. 
the, the good thing that has happened because of this um, commercial, I think, is that people feel a little more comfortable talking about it. Um, that, that it's, you know, I mean, as they say on the, it says, talk to your doctor. And so people are coming to us saying, well, you know, wait a minute, I, I saw this thing on TV and, you know, I've had this sort of thing happen where, boy, I just saw it for a minute, I saw, I saw a little squirrel back there. Um, and I asked my husband and he didn't see it. Um, is that a hallucination? So let's talk about it. It's, so what is a hallucination? There's sort of a definition up there, a false or distorted sensory experience that appears to be real. It's generated by the mind rather than the, anything that's actually real. Um, hallucinations can be um, visual, they can be auditory, they can be sensory or even um, a funny taste or a smell. Quite commonly in Parkinson's, hallucinations are visual. It's often people or animals um, that, that is the thing you're experiencing. Um, it, it may sort of start with just the sense that there's something just a little bit out of your field of vision. Um, you thought you saw it over there and then it went away. Um, in my house, it's probably actually there. Um, <laughs> but I caught him the other night. <laughs> um, yeah, very little, has a long tail. Um, yeah, anyway, so, um, so a fair proportion of people with Parkinson's can develop hallucinations down the road, and often hallucinations and, and significant cognitive change start to appear roughly at the same time. It just tells you that this disease is now affecting the cortex, the, the thinking and perceiving part of the brain. It's not just the brain stem that modulates movement, it's the thinking and, and processing part of the brain now. Uh, so an illusion is, is this, um, the classic illusion would be a, a mailbox. Well, what, you know, it is, it's sort of a body with a head. Um, but you're just sort of misperceiving what that thing is. And that, you would use the word illusion. As I said, visual hallucination, so it could just be a flash of light. Um, but but co commonly, it's a fairly complex um, set of, um, a, a complex object or animal or thing that you're seeing. So how do we address all these things? Now you've got all this gloom and doom, all this bad stuff that can happen. What do we do about it? Well, um, first of all, there are all kinds of other things that can temporarily impact on, on how you're thinking and functioning mentally. Uh, just a simple bladder infection um, or being dehydrated or having a low sodium level. So my nurses are trained that if somebody calls um, and says, you know, I've been functioning like this, and all of a sudden something changed dramatically in the last three days, and I can't think or I can't move or whatever it might be, my nurses are trained to say, go to your doctor and get checked for a bladder infection. Do you have an abscessed tooth? Is, are you dehydrated? Because um, any of these superimposed medical problems could just temporarily make your neurologic function worse. And it's not really like you're gonna take more levodopa. You have to treat whatever the, that superimposed medical problem is, and then you'll presumably get back to yourself again. So exclude other things, infections or, or you know, pneumonia or you know, too low a sodium or too high a blood sugar. Another thing that can impact on cognition is all those darn pills the doctors prescribe. How many people are taking um, five or more? No, so let's see. I'll, how many people are just taking less than five prescription drugs? How many people are taking five to ten prescribed drugs? How many are taking more than ten prescribed medications? Yeah. I mean, does God even know what happens when you have a bowl full of pills for breakfast in the morning? You know, we know what this pill does. We know what that pill does. We know why you're trying to take this one. But what do all these things really do when you put them all in your body all at once? And so there's a, a tendency for doctors to want to prescribe pills because then we're doing something to help you. And then the older you get, it starts to add up to be more and more and more pills. So, you know, think about the medications. Are there, are there any that you can do without or take a lower dose? And, and, um, and just in general, 
to simplify the medication list um, rather than complexify it. Um, and then there are things we can do just, um, um, I have many patients who for the last 15 years, ever since they were diagnosed with Parkinson's, they go down to the Palm Springs in the winter, they go up to the cabin in the summer, and then they go visit their grandkids in Philadelphia and Seattle, and you know, doing this sort of worldwide travel thing, um, or countrywide travel, and that can get really confusing. Um, if you're struggling to sort of know what day it is today and to know that the bathroom is down the hall to the left and then you go to your daughter's house and the bathroom's down the room to the right and then you go to your place, your cabin and the, you, know, you, don't, you, you have a rustic cabin that doesn't have a bathroom. Um, you know, all, all this can get really confusing and where you used to think that travel was an uplifting, fun, great thing and good for everybody you may reach a point where you, you, know, you kind of rein in that, that travel a little bit. It just becomes more of a hassle, more confusing, more disruptive than it is helpful. So a structured or familiar environment, a daily schedule that's pretty routine, that's useful in Parkinson's anyway. Um, how many people take their Parkinson pills at 7 and 11 and 3? And how many just sort of take them three times a day when they feel like it? Some people take them just sort of, you know, the doctor said, well, three times a day or four times a day, and you just sort of figure out when it feels like you might want to take it. Um, I, I struggle sometimes with, with you know, I, I usually sort of say, well, you should take it first thing in the morning. What time do you get up in the morning? And I struggle with the patient who says, oh, any time between 6 and 11. <laughs> it's like, how am I supposed to know how many doses of medicine you're going to take in a day if you're getting up any time between 6 and 11? What time do you go to bed? Well... <laughs> Any time from 9 p.m. until 3, I lay in bed reading, and then I watch TV, and, but I don't sleep very well. Um, we do think that we can actually help um, train memory um, uh, at certain stages in the disease, probably not you know, stage 5 Parkinson's disease, but um, just as we tell people to exercise. Anybody in the room ever been told to exercise? Anybody in the room ever not been told to exercise? Please raise your hand and I'll give you a personal um, encouragement. Yeah, so just as you can exercise your body, you can exercise your brain too. Um, I see very commonly um, 67 year old people in my clinic, not just the Parkinson's clinic, but just the general clinic saying, you know, I'm 67 and I'm worried I've got Alzheimer's because I can't think as well anymore. And I say, well, tell me more. They say, well, I retired when I was 65. And now I'm 67, and you know, I get up, I read the paper, I watch TV, I cut the grass, I take a nap. You know, they're, you're just not as mentally active after you retire as you were when you were still working, no matter what you did for a job. It doesn't matter whether your job was insurance broker or bricklayer, either, either job, you had to get up, you had to get dressed, you had to remember the names of the people you're working with, you had to receive an assignment or give an assignment, you had to accomplish something in a certain amount of time, you had to go do something else, you had to schedule your lunch, uh, bring money with you or bring your lunch, you know. This, this is mentally complex activity and then you retire, thank God you retire, you don't have to run through rush hour traffic anymore, but then you don't really do as much and then you become less mentally facile. So by training, by working on your um, cognition, we can actually make it better. Does anybody believe that? Yes, oh good, okay. So there are drugs to treat um, cognition. They're all marketed as drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so there are three that are in a category um, together. There's donepezil, um, I wonder why I didn't put the third one up there. Uh, there's Aricept Exelon and uh, Razadine, so um, galantamine, rivastigmine, and donepezil. Um, and then there's one that's in a category by itself called memantine or nemenda. Um, the only one of these drugs has actually been studied in Lewy body disease is the Exelon, um, the rivastigmine. Uh, I don't particularly think that Rivastigmine is uniquely beneficial in Lewy body disease and that other drugs in that same category wouldn't be, 
but rivastigmine is the only one that's actually been studied and has an FDA indication for uh, Lewy body. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the FDA, um, because the doctors have sort of distinguished Lewy body from Parkinson's disease with dementia, um, drugs that are approved for Parkinson's disease are not sort of automatically approved for Lewy body and vice versa. Um, so you'll run into trouble with your insurance company paying for whatever the drug might be if, we, if the doctors have used the, you know, one term or the other to describe your condition. Um, for the psychosis, and I hate that word, but psychosis is kind of the ugly word. It's an ugly word like dementia. Um, <clears throat> sort of an ugly word for hallucinations and delusions and illusions. Um, obviously, reducing any medications that might be promoting hallucinations, all Parkinson pills promote hallucinations. All of our Parkinson pills, and one thing um, Mel didn't quite say correctly, there's not just one part of the brain that uses dopamine. There's two parts of the brain that use dopamine. One is that substantia nigra where all those movement cells are, so if you don't have enough dopamine in that part of the brain, then you have these movement problems. And then we, what do we do? We have you eat dopamine to help those cells work better, and then you move better. But there's a second part of the brain that uses dopamine too, called the limbic system, that has to do with how you perceive things and how you feel. And here we are taking you know, 85-year-olds and pumping them full of dopamine. We don't have a way to make the dopamine only go to the moving part of the brain and not to the thinking and perceiving part of the brain. So little wonder, as we give you bigger and bigger doses of levodopa, and you have more and more brain injury from your Parkinson's disease, at some point, we might tip over into getting these hallucinations. So what might you do? You might peel back some of those Parkinson pills. Do you really need all those Parkinson pills? Um, if you're on four different Parkinson pills, do you really need all four of them? Do you really need levodopa and amantadine and pramipexol and selegiline? Or at this point, 15 years into your disease, could you simplify the Parkinson's medications? Does that make sense? Because sometimes it's usually taking away Parkinson pills isn't going to cure the hallucination problem, but it might take the edge off of it. Um, and that may be enough for some people that you don't need to do what we do next, which is to add another pill. So there are all kinds of pills on the market to treat hallucinations. You know what they all do? They all block dopamine. So in the psychiatry clinic where they're treating people with schizophrenia or people with hallucinations, the drugs they use to stop hallucinations are drugs that block dopamine. They want to block dopamine in that limbic system. And of course... If, you give, uh, if you're in the psychiatry clinic and you give somebody too much of their dopamine-blocking drug, what happens? They come back for their follow-up appointment looking like they have Parkinson's at age 40. So, um, so all Parkinson pills, all dopamine pills promote hallucinations. All the antipsychotic drugs that are dopamine-blocking drugs uh, could tend to make your Parkinson's worse. So how are you going to deal with that? Just by hook or by crook, we have decided, many doctors decided um, after just trying all the different hallucination drugs, that of all the dopamine blocking drugs, all of the usual antipsychotic drugs, quetiapine and clozapine are two that seem, just in our experience, to have less tendency to make the Parkinson's worse. It's important to know neither of these drugs has actually really been studied in a double-line randomized controlled trial to prove that they actually work. It is the impression of many of us who use them that they do um, in some people. Um, but they, they, you know, even those drugs don't work for everybody. And quetiapine can be sedating. Um, clozapine requires monthly or weekly, weekly to monthly blood draws for the entire time that you're on the drug. Um, so these are sort of challenging drugs to use, um, although we use them fairly frequently. Pimavanserin is this new drug that we talked about. That there's a commercial on TV about um, that was approved a couple of years ago specifically to treat hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. And um, because it's new, nobody's been on it for 20 years yet, so we don't know what happens over 20 years. 
The cool thing about this drug, it's the only drug to treat hallucinations that doesn't revolve around um, blocking dopamine. The, the how it works chemically in the brain is a little bit different. It works on a different chemical, serotonin, that turns out maybe to actually also be involved in the hallucinations. So, I guess I talked too long. <laughs> Help? <laughs> um, uh, so, um, so, so it's nice that it works differently, and in theory, one could, I suppose, take pimavanserin and quetiapine because they work in a slightly different way. So if you have really bad hallucinations, you could take one of each. Um, in reality, these, you know, it's always a struggle when this kind of problem starts to occur um, because we sort of have the sense that the more medications, the worse it's going to be, the more groggy you're going to be, the more over sort of over-drugged in general you're going to be, but yet seeing strange people in the room is not a fun thing either. So, so we have to tiptoe very delicately on um, which drugs to use and how to use them. So, um, so you guys have um, the handout in front of you, so with or without the slides, we have all kinds of other slides and I have five minutes left. I mentioned the cognitive training. I don't really need to go into detail about, um, about that. So, so there's small studies on cognitive training, not any huge studies that prove that it works, um, but, but it's one of the things that we do offer um, at Struthers, and I often forget to think about it. So if you feel like you're having cognitive changes and I'm not mentioning it to you or your doctor isn't mentioning it to you, you can mention it to us to say, well, you know, I'd like to, just like I go to physical therapy to talk about physical exercises, um, can I go to cognitive therapy and learn some cognitive exercises? Speaking of exercise, um, this is now slide 52, um, exercise, just plain old exercise is really useful too. As I said, if you go to the gym or even if you're just riding the, um, doing the elliptical in your own house, um, you have to get dressed, you have to put on your shoes, you have to, you know, know what time it is, figure out how many minutes you're going to do it, you, you know, so, so it requires thinking and organizing just to, to do exercise. Clearly improves um, heart and lung function, but it also um, seems to improve um, uh, cognitive function. There's a picture of a little rat running on the, on the treadmill. Um, so they've done studies both in animals uh, actually, it was animals with Alzheimer's disease, uh, and they had half the animals in a cage that had a little water bottle and a little food tray, and they had the other half of the animals in this gymnasium of, you know, little tubes to run through and mazes to run in and on and all kinds of stuff, and guess which mice did better? <laughs> the, the ones in the enriched environment. Um, so, so there... You know, how much exercise, you know, moderate intensity, you know, 40 to 60 minutes, three times a week, something like 120, 180 minutes a week would be good. Um, you know, does it, um, does it really cure Parkinson's? No, it doesn't cure Parkinson's, but hopefully you enjoy doing it, number one. Number two, it makes you physically better, and number three, you're preserving pathways in the brain. So the right exercise in the end is the one that you'll actually do. So people do sometimes say, well, what kind of exercise? And I say, well, uh, you can go swimming. Well, I hated swimming. I always used to sink. Well, okay, swimming is not going to work for you. How about, you know, how about skiing um, or Nordic walking or, um, you know, anything that sort of is an aerobic exercise, but you have to do it more than once. So I don't have the control. Um, so then there's um, sort of practical tips. Um, I think it's important for people to succeed. How many people feel better when they're failing? <laughs> you know, just when I say the word fail, I sort of droop. When I say the word succeed, I sort of sit up straighter. That's good for my Parkinson's. So if you're beating your head against the wall, trying to do something you just can't do anymore, it really is good to be honest about it paying the bills, doing the taxes, tax season coming up, and you're just at sea trying to figure out what slips to do what with, and the, you know, the numbers just don't make sense anymore. You're just not able to process that the way you used to. You need to get help doing those kind of things. You need to 
first of all, if it's something that's dangerous, like driving or, um, you know, nobody else gets hurt if you screw up the taxes, but you can get hurt if you screw them up, um, you know, ask for help. Um, and it's better to ask for help before some kind of crisis comes up. So um, there's also um, rem remembering to take your pills. You can end up downright sick if you screw up taking your pills. So having the right kind of reminder for your pills. How many people have little fancy pill, you know, containers with a week's worth of pills? How many people have an automatic daughter that comes over to <laughs> set up your pills each week or an automatic spouse? Um, you know, whatever works. And, and again, you need to be honest um, about the things that work. I think I had cut some of these slides up. But, um, so um, another sort of obvious thing is just, you know, if you can never figure out where you put your glasses, you have to make a rule. You only put your glasses in one place. Well, she's got them around her neck. That's the best place for them. So then you know you won't lose them. Um, and this is, um, yeah, and if you can't figure out how to set your cell phone or, you know, use a, you know, hire a, hire a six-month-old. <laughs> and, and, and they can probably tell you how to turn on a computer and make it work. Um, now, hire a 13-year-old. I mean, they, they've grown up with these things attached to their fingers. They'd be thrilled to help grandma, you know, set up an alarm on their phone. Uh, do you guys want me to beat on driving anymore? Have I beat on it enough? You don't want to hear about it. You know, just please, I, I, I had a patient once, it was a, long, a while ago, who drove for one day too long, and the other guy didn't live through it. And I really don't want that ever to happen to anybody, el any others of my patients, let alone the other guy. Um, so, so I, you know, if you're limiting your driving appropriately, um, you know, that's probably better. I worry more about the people who say, honey, I've been driving for longer than you have been alive. And you don't tell me I can't drive. I was a truck driver. Um, those are the people I worry about, the ones who just don't acknowledge that there's any possibility that anything could ever impact on their ability to drive. I get it in Minnesota, there's no other way to get anywhere. And so you're, you're really um, cutting off your legs if we take away the car keys. Um, and how, so part of it is how will you get around if you're not driving anymore? So think about that ahead of time, because it's, it's not the day you die in general, that's the day you lose the ability to drive. It's sometime before then, and there's always a fight about it. So I won't say any more about driving. Bring your right, see I think I had cut some of these slides out, but hey, look, I'm done. So in summary, cognitive changes happen. Hallucinations and dementia often sort of start occurring at roughly the same time, not usually the first five years or 10 years. In fact, if it does happen in the first five years, then it's probably not Parkinson's disease. That's when we might change the name to Lewy body disease. Um, any abrupt change should prompt a search for some abrupt superimposed medical problem. Cognitive training can be helpful, um, whether you do it in a formal way or whether you just join a book club or, you know, get on the speaker's thing at the, uh, you know, at the VFW or go to church and actually participate. Um, do volunteer work. Exercise can help and, you know, you cannot do this by yourself. Lunch, catered by Chef Jeff. Do we have time for a question? We have lots of time because they're just quietly putting food around. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So, um, so she's saying that. Um, Again, at, at our center at Struthers and a lot of um, other hospitals and clinics will do this as well. Um, the, the occupational therapist can do this sort of driving screen. It's an office sort of computer test um, that looks at a number of different, um, what I call domains, things that need to function that we think are important to driving well. So it's everything from can you turn your head to how is your depth perception to what about your reaction time. Um, and the occupational therapist can do this screening test. And, you know, if there's 10 domains on this and you're doing swimmingly, you're doing great on 10 out of 10 domains, and you're probably good to go. Isn't that nice to know? That's pretty cool. And if you're struggling on 6 out of 10 domains, 
that may lead to a recommendation for a behind the wheel test. So the, if you're struggling on six out of 10 domains that have to do with driving, you don't have a whole lot of things you're doing well on to compensate for the ones you're not doing well on. The burden then really is on you to prove that despite all that, you're still good to go, you're still safe. The OT eval is generally paid for by your insurance. The behind the wheel eval, I think, is often something you end up paying for. Um, but I, I think it's useful, again, to talk about it ahead of time. Um, people often ask me, you know, here I am in my windowless exam room, and, and you know, the wife is saying, I don't want to drive, and the husband's saying, I'm fine. Um, and everybody's saying, well, doctor, you decide. Well, how am I, I mean, you're a nice guy. You know, you've driven well for all your life, but how do I know that you're still able to drive? Let's get a little bit of objective data. So it's not just you fighting with your wife, it's not me fighting with you, it's let's have objective data, it's a test done the same way for everybody. ADLS. Oh, ADLS, so um, activities of daily living. Yep. Activities of daily living, so it's things like bathing, dressing, grooming. Um, there's also things that they sometimes call IADLs, um, which are the instrumental activities of daily living, things where you have to use a piece of equipment like stirring and cooking and, and um, you know, cutting the grass and things like that. Can you address where Parkinson's might be with stem cell research? So where are we at with stem cell research? So the, the problem with um, stem cell research is that you can't get federal funding um, to do stem cell research. So most of the research in the U.S. on stem cells being done in California, where they have this California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. I, you know, I think it's, stem cells are sort of creeping along. Um, it doesn't, um, because it's not sort of a, a you know, federally funded great initiative, but, but there is still work being done on stem cells. I don't think it's going to be here today or tomorrow or next year. Um, I think that um, there are other approaches that are also looking promising that are sort of invasive surgical kinds of things. So gene therapy trials, um, there's one that was came out of a phase one trial fairly recently of a, um, a an injection into the brain of a virus that is uh, into that the virus has been deactivated so it doesn't make you sick but a virus is basically a syringe that injects DNA into a cell so if there's some piece of DNA you'd like to inject into a cell you hook that piece of DNA to a virus um, and they decided they wanted to inject the enzyme that makes dopamine um, so the rate limiting step in the production of dopamine is an enzyme called AADC. So this was the AAV AADC trial that actually came out looking pretty good. Um, so stem cells is one area, but I think um, these um, sort of genetic approaches is another. Um, stem cells has kind of been creeping along slowly. And a related question is, can I just go to Mexico and get stem cells? Sure, um, and the clinic you go to in Mexico is going to say it's good for everything. It's good for rheumatoid arthritis, it'll cure cancer, and, part, and I've never, never heard of multiple systems atrophy, but I'm sure it'll help that too. Um, so I really would um, discourage people from getting um, tourist, uh, you know, going the sort of tourist medicine route to some other country to get a stem cell injection. I think that's at this point, the, 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 the people who are offering that as a, as a treatment are not collecting data about it. And so they're really preying upon desperate people in making money. Um, so. Oh, over here. Oh, somebody got a, you got yeah, okay. a microphone. Uh, how about an update on DOPA? Uh, from people that talk about the challenges of keeping, you know, on schedule with meds and stuff to, uh, like that. Uh, my wife does happen to have the system and it's been marvelous, but I guess what's your perspective of Duopa? How's that helping? So how many people in the room have ever heard of Duopa? How many people have never heard of Duopa? So Duopa um, is 
it came out probably you know, maybe three or four years ago. It's a continuous intestinal pump infusion of levodopa. So it requires a tube to be inserted through the skin into the stomach, actually into the intestine. It's hooked to a pump and you plug in the cassette each morning and turn on the pump and it drips levodopa continuously into the intestine. Um, it's a marvelous treatment for a small subset of people. So, you know, if you're taking levodopa every hour and a half and you're up and down and up and down and, oh my God, if, you've, if you're 20 minutes late with a dose, there's hell to pay for the rest of the day, that's somebody who really ought to think about um, just turning on the pump and be done with it. You're, you're good for the day. Um, there are, you know, hassles about, you know, obviously you have a tube that goes through the skin, you have to do some site care, you have to, somebody has to be able to plug in the cassette, clean out the tubing, and all these sorts of things. So there's a little bit of a hassle factor. Um, it's easier done if you have a spouse who can help you with it. If you're living up in the, you know, north country by yourself, um, that's not going to work so well. Um, and... And I'm not sure you would really be um, scuba diving, skydiving, um, you know, alpine skiing, you know, some of these things with, with the tube. I, so I think of it often as a treatment for people whose lifestyle is, is relatively sedate. Um, although I did have somebody travel to Norway with the, who, who had a pump. Um, so so I, it's a wonderful treatment for a certain subset of people, and I'm glad it's worked well um, for, for you. All right. My question earlier was, there has been some um, things in the news that have related whether you have your appendix in or out and whether or not you're more prone to have Parkinson's. Is there any truth to any of that, or where is that gone? So how many, how many people with Parkinson's in this room um, still have their appendix? How many people in the room with Parkinson's don't have an appendix? So I don't know. It's uh, you know, it's kind of like how many people have REM behavior disorder and can't smell, um, or have tremor and don't have tremor. So this is there's this this growing body of evidence that we don't quite know what to do with yet. That somehow Parkinson's um, does, in fact, in the end, have something to do with something you ate or something you breathed or something you inhaled or were exposed to. The 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 that. That um, report was basically, you know, one of these epidemiological things where they just, you know, why anybody even looked at that particular data point, I have no idea. Um, but, you know, glad they did. I mean, that's how you get novel ideas is somebody, you know, just saying, look, well, we know whether they had right arm surgery and we know whether they had an appendectomy, so let's, let's ask the question. And lo and behold, um, there's a higher rate of... Um, Parkinson's and people who still had an appendix. Um, that does not mean that we should all rush out and get an appendectomy so that we won't get Parkinson's. We're just not at all at that level of understanding. We're still sort of scrambling, trying to figure out if, why this would make any sense at all. Um, but there it is, and it's a tantalizing little piece of evidence and, and kind of a cool idea about why you keep doing research because you get new ideas. Last question. A couple quick questions. Can yep. you comment on autonomic nervous system dysfunction and it relation, its relationship to Parkinson's? And also, is there any relationship between Parkinson's and uh, vascular diseases such as DVTs and PEs? Uh, so the second question is, there, there's no um, direct relationship between Parkinson's and blood clots. Um, the only connection would be is if you're very inactive because of your Parkinson's and you're sitting all the time, then you may be at an in increased risk of blood clot. But there's not, um, I mean, there's some people who are genetically predisposed to blood clotting and the thing that genetically predisposes to blood clotting has nothing to do with Parkinson's and the two conditions have nothing to do with each other. The autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that takes care of things that we think of as being automatic. So you don't have to make your pupils dilate when it's dark, they just kind of do it on their own. And you don't have to you know, make yourself sweat when it's hot outside. I don't know, the sweat just sort of happens. Um, and so all those things from um, uh, how the food moves through your intestines to how the urine comes out to how you 
maintain your, how on earth do we maintain our blood pressure when we stand up? Why doesn't gravity push all the blood down to your feet? Isn't it remarkable that, that any of us can stand up without fainting? So we have all kinds of little tiny nerves in the body that do all kinds of these remarkable things kind of automatically, and those nerves are nibbled on by Parkinson's. And so it's very common, that's on that list, I didn't sort of dwell on it today because the talk was about um, thinking, but um, uh, everybody with Parkinson's is constipated, everybody with Parkinson's is up peeing all night. Um, a lot of times people with Parkinson's have poor heat tolerance, they don't sweat uh, as well as they should. And then this business where when you stand up and your blood pressure drops, which we call orthostatic hypotension, is very common in people with Parkinson's. Um, so yes, Parkinson's does sort of nibble away at the autonomic nervous system um, to a greater or lesser extent in people with Parkinson's. If it's a really dramatic um, dysfunction, then we change the name from Parkinson's to multiple systems atrophy. So MSA is sort of Parkinson's with a lot of autonomic dysfunction.